All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is GE 101. It's the second week and the online lecture for the for Thursday. So fantastic job. Sorry about the reflection. I don't seem to be able to get rid of it. So I'll probably take my glasses off in a second once I make myself smaller. But great job on the ping pong ball launcher. I was impressed. Uh, some of you got to it super fast and just probably flew through the brainstorming session, probably flew through uh, the research part, you know, just, just went straight to solution, which is expected. So now I want to kind of slow down the design loop. I want to define the problem solving process that we want to work with and force you to go through the steps. So I'm not sure I'll get to design loop today. I'm going to talk about teams and teamwork, and I'm going to talk about grit, which is kind of a hobby of mine. So um, let's go through those things, and then you'll have a little project to do and submit um, for today. So I'm going to make myself smaller and get myself out of the way. So now we can just look at the PowerPoint. All right, so grit is actually uh, something that's been researched. Um, probably only over the last 10 years I've they've been focused on grit and trying to understand what it is. But um, I've done a fair bit of reading on it and I've done a lot of pondering on it, especially with students, because I believe that if I could teach you grit, which I don't think I can, uh, I can only expose you to grit. Um, I think if I could teach it to you, I wouldn't have to teach you anything else. Like that would be all I would need to teach you. And you would be gritty enough to learn everything else probably on your own without me. So it's, I think, super important to think about. Um, grit deals with long-term goals. Long-term means not like a week or a month, but years. Um, if you have a goal and all of you do, because you have entered the engineering uh, discipline and engineering education, you have a long-term goal, which is to get a degree, whether that's two-year or four-year, those are still some long-term goals. Um, so grit only applies to long-term goals. It doesn't apply to short time frames. And it is a better indicator, indicator than, than happiness or IQ. If you have a high grit score, that's more important than a high IQ. Research has shown that. So that's pretty fascinating. Like being gritty is more important than being smart. I think you still got to be somewhat smart, but grit is a huge indicator of success. So let's kind of define what grit is and what it's not. So courage, is, it's hard to measure, directly proportional to your level of grit. More specifically, your ability to manage fear of failure is imperative and a predictor of success. So the supremely gritty are not afraid to tank or fail, but rather embrace it as part of the learning process. So you must have courage, which I'd like to say you all have because you registered for an engineering class. So that alone took some courage just to say, okay, I think I want to do this, right? All right. So this next part, uh, I'm just going to read through it. Um, it's being conscientious, conscien conscientiousness compared to dependable. So there are five core characters from which all human personalities stem, right? The big five, they are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neurotic. So this is all from brain science, right? And in psychology. Um, so then it goes through like the differences between conscientiousness, whoops, sorry, and uh, the, other, the other parts, right? But this one is most closely associated with grit. There are two types. Careful, painstaking, and meticulous is conscientiousness. So that is an indicator of a high grit score if you have these characteristics. So, which most of you do because you've chosen engineering and most engineering students have this ability to be meticulous, right? Even if they haven't honed that trait, like they haven't practiced it a lot, it's typically there. 
And I could see it in your ping pong ball launchers, you know? Uh, some of you are getting protractors out and you were being pretty meticulous about like, hey, let's figure out what this angle is. Uh, let's try and get this angle to, you know, and tweak it, fine tune it type of thing. All right. So long-term goals and endurance. Endurance is a big thing. Um, this is the individual talking about Duckworth. As I wrote in the introduction, this is Duckworth talking, actually, she's the researcher. I had some reservations about accepting the difference between Webster's definition of grit and Duckworth's interpretation. Both have to do with perseverance, but the later exists in the arena of extraordinary success and therefore requires a long-term time commitment. So endurance is a little bit like grit in that it's over a long period of time. And this Susan Duckworth, writes, achievement is the product of talent and effort, the latter of a function of the intensity, direction, and duration of one's exertions towards a long-term goal. So, talent and effort. All right, uh, resilience, I like that. I'm gonna read the red. Uh, it gives you the strength to get up, wipe the dust off, and remount. So, resilience means you can deal with failure, and you can work through failure. Um, I That's one of the reasons why I coach baseball, because it is a failure sport. We fail so much in baseball, and I know there's some baseball players in the room, but baseball is a fail sport. Like if you get a hit three out of 10 times, that is super good. That's successful. Where it feels like that's kind of a failure. Seven times you didn't get a hit when you step into the batter's box. So Coaching baseball is coaching failure, like how to deal with it, how to bounce back from it, how to, you know, get back on the horse and, and get her done. It's not long term, typically, unless you play baseball for a very long time. So resilience is a dynamic combination of optimism and creativity. Right. So super interesting. And this is my favorite, excellence versus perfection. So in general, gritty people don't seek perfection, but instead strive for excellence. So perfection is, it's like a moving target. Down below it says perfection is an excellent, is excellence somewhat Persinius cousin. It's like this, you know, friend. It is ped pedantic, wow. Binary, unforgiving, and inflexible. That's perfection. Very binary, right? And that's not what we're trying to achieve in grit. We're trying to achieve excellence. Excellence is an attitude, not an end game. Fulfillment of purpose or function and is closely associated with virtue. So we can go off on a really sidebar as far as what virtue is. So it is far more forgiving, allowing embracing failure and vulnerability in the ongoing quest for improvement. It allows for disappointment and prioritizes progress over perfection. So I think it's good for you to be aware of this, right? To be gritty, um, it has these characteristics, right? You have to have a high interest area in whatever you're doing. You have to have a passion. So if, if the passion's not there, you're not going to be gritty enough to succeed. Um, they say it's 10 years or 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. So in engineering, you're going to get four or five or six years of deliberate practice before you get, you get your degree, right? Um, so that's part of grit, but there should be a passion there underneath somewhere, a high interest, and then... For true grit to show up, you need a purpose beyond yourself. So, for instance, the purpose in getting an engineering degree cannot be money for yourself. That's not going to be a big enough purpose. That won't get you through. Now, financial security could be a purpose that you're looking for because maybe you've come from an, an environment that didn't have that, right? So therefore there is passion and there is purpose there. And maybe you're gonna support others, right? Your family, grandparents, um, adoption, a number of other purposes for making the kind of 
uh, income that you're going to make. Uh, the other piece to grit is hope. You find super gritty people, they are hopeful for the future. And they also will fail through the process. So, you know, through whatever you're trying to persevere through, there's failure. There has to be failure in order for grit to fully kind of blossom. Okay. And you're going to experience failure at school. Like you're going to fail on a quiz or an exam or maybe even a class. And how you respond to that is kind of your grit score. All right. Probably enough about grit. There is some things that will improve your grit. Um, I don't like to just talk about like what it is and how we don't have it, but also like how to improve this grit score, right? Number one is find a passion, something that you are passionate about and very interested in and want to work in that area. If you can find a passion, then that will lend itself to being gritty. And, uh, you know, Duckworth talks about it in her book. Uh, I don't think people can become truly gritty and great at things they don't love. So when you try to develop grit in students, we also need to find and help them cultivate their passions. So I do believe you start, you need to start thinking about a passion. And there's lots of very important problems to solve out there. And there's no reason you can't start to think about those problems now, right? So, you know, energy is going to be a problem of the future. Fossil fuels and how we deal with that is going to be a problem. Right now we have a huge homeless problem. Uh, those are all things that you could be passionate about and begin to think about how to solve. All right, two, recognize that frustration, confusion, and practice are just part of the course. Like, okay, uh, I'm going to get frustrated at some point in this process of becoming an engineer. Uh, that's just going to happen, and I need to be prepared for it and work my way through it. Take risks. As a student, take some risks in your education. Grit demands risk taking. Successful people are willing to step out of their comfort zones and risk failure in order to learn something new or pursue a long-term goal. And while by definition a risk may end up in failure, successful adults don't give up. Okay, so I saw some of you in class at the ping pong ball launcher being silent. And that's usually just you not being willing to take a risk, like, eh, I'm not going to toss out what I think quite yet. I'm going to see what's going on. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But at some point, I want you to start taking risks. Like, I want you to start speaking up and sharing your information. Realize it could be like frustrating and not be what the group wants to do, or maybe not even what I say you should do, right? But take the risk. All right. Teach that failure is not the end. I think this is targeted to me and I'm just sharing it with you. Um, failure is not the end. Failure is just part of success, right? So you can see a few statistics here that are kind of interesting. Uh, 5,127 fails before Dyson got it right with his vacuum. So that's a lot of failure. A number of rejections Stephen King got before his first novel was 30 rejections. I think I would handle about four rejections. And I would say, okay, I'm not meant to be a writer. But if it was your passion, that's different. Four million, the number of dollars lost on GoPro inventor Nick Woodman's failed first company. You, you'll find this in a lot of successful companies that they have a number of failed companies prior to it, right? So it, it means failure is not the end. Like it, sometimes it's just the beginning. All right, personal grit story. These come in all sizes and shapes. Um, I'm gonna share one that's not, um, mean, like you won't, you might not think that's really gritty, okay? Um, some folks have medical stories that are intensely gritty like on a different level of grit. Others have family stories that are on a different level of grit, right? So I'm kind of keeping it light with my grit story, but it is a grit story. And I'm just gonna share it, share it with you because you're gonna share one with me. 
Uh, and maybe you don't think you have a great story, but you probably do. It might not be as intense as somebody else's. I don't really care. Uh, we're going to do it in the journal area of Blackboard. You're going to post up your grid story to me. Um, but just think about the parameters of it. It has to be long term. It has to include failures. And it has to be something that you you worked your way through. OK, doesn't need to be that personal. I don't need super personal information, but I just want you to think about like, what is my grit story and do I have grit? And if I do, how do I think I have demonstrated that? you know, in the past. Um, I'm going to use, like I said, kind of a lighthearted one, uh, my windsurfing experience. So I am a 40-year windsurfer. I'm pretty old, so you can figure out probably how old I am if you'd like. But in 1987, we mail-ordered our windsurfers. There was no windsurfing on the West Coast. Uh, I was at Oregon Institute of Technology going to school as a sophomore. And uh, we ordered them because we thought it looked fun. Um, like, what the heck is this? We were sailors, um, not surfers, uh, but we thought, man, you stand on a board and you can drive this thing. Um, so then we worked at it. We read the instructions. We used our sailing knowledge. And by a year later, and a lot of work in the lake, very cold water, we kind of mastered this thing called longboarding, and that's that's this up in this corner. This is a longboard. Uh, they don't plane. They don't get moving fast. They're like sailboats. They go slow, and you steer them by maneuvering the sail around, right? But then the, the sport was evolving at the same time we were learning it, and there was uh, something called the transition board. So we bought those uh, in 89, and, and when I say we spent the summer doing it, I would sail about... In the beginning, probably only about 30 or 40 days of the summer. But by the time I got into shortboarding, I was 90 days in the summer to, to try and figure this thing out. So we went to transition boards. There was no water start. This is called a water start. This was There was no water start. You had to pull the sail up with this line. But a transition board was lighter, a little more streamlined, and it would plane. It would get up and plane. Down here in the lower right is plane sailing where you're actually skipping on the water and planing. And this is a transition board sailing environment down here. Flat water, go pretty fast. Uh, big board though, and really cumbersome to move around. So in 90, short board started. Uh, so we got those right away and uh, started to learn to water start. And this is a water start where you let the wind pull you, pull you out of the water to start instead of having to pull it up. There's three sports in windsurfing. There's longboard, transition, and shortboard. Um, so this is over a span of nearly 10 years now um, that I was trying to learn to actually shortboard windsurf. Um, in 97 to 2000, we got pretty competent at shortboarding. So then we moved to wave sailing, and that's here. Um, lots of failure in the middle. Um, I sold my transition board because I, I was done. I was like, this is so stupid. I was spending hours trying to figure it out and just being frustrated and, and worked, like, you know, physically worked. Um, but then it was like six months later, I, I after a winter, you know, because it's a summer sport, I, I got another one and said, I can do this. I can figure this out. So we persisted through it. And uh, now I've been sailing shortboards, um, you know, for for a very long time and I'm very proficient at it, but that's a little bit of grit there because it is a long time frame. It is a very difficult sport to learn. That's why it's not too popular now because it is very difficult, um, but it's, you know, it's migrated into kiting and uh, foiling and everything else in which I'm an active participant of. So there you go, my grit story. Let's talk about teams just real quick because we need some knowledge on teamwork. Uh, don't forget to post up your grit story, right, in Blackboard. I'll make that do, I'll give you till Monday to get that done. Uh, but I haven't made the site yet, so by the time you see this, it'll be available for you to post up. So give me a narrative, full sentences. Some of you just have answered questions, one word stuff. No more of that. I want full sentences, some effort, and uh, tell me your grit story. All right, let's talk about teamwork. So. Why do we work in teams as engineers? 
well, you can't be an expert at everything. You learn and understand better when you collaborate. And we'll talk about collaboration in a second. Design, manufacturing, implementation teams may be separated by distance, but there's all these different, you know, teams that have expertise. So you can't have all that expertise. Uh, you can get things done faster when you split the work up. So teams are more efficient. Diversity in teams will bring diversity to the thought, the decision, and the problem solving, and the solution. So the more diversity we have in teams, the better that team will function. All right. Collaboration. So this is one of my favorite words, and I think it's misunderstood by most. A process of shared creation. Two or more individuals with complementary skills, so different skills, but they complement each other, interacting to create a shared understanding that none had previously possessed or could have come up with or to on their own. So the solution that you get is not possible by being an individual. It would take a collaboration to get to that solution. That is what true collaboration is. So if you go into a team and you convince them all to do everything your way, that is not collaboration. You do not have a collaboration process and you don't have a, a good solution. So love that. Project management is, you know, that's how we form teams and that's how we function. So it's just a way of organizing individuals. Um, it could be by product, it could be by skill set, it could be by function, lots of different things. So helping behaviors, hindering behaviors, I'm sure you all have, uh, at least when I do this in class, you all have good examples of both of these, right? Helping behaviors and hindering behaviors. And I'll expand on this in another class, but successful teams have a common goal. That means that you've got to discuss the goal and the problem. You, you understand the problem as a team, not as an individual. Successful teams will have leadership. Successful teams, uh, members make unique contributions in these teams. Effective communications, all successful teams communicate well. So we'll talk about that. And then they're excited. Like you don't wanna show up to your team and go, oh God, I hate this shit. You know, you don't want, excuse me. You don't want that. Uh, you wanna be excited coming to your team and you want your team members to be excited. And that's gonna make a better functioning team. Uh, and then you got to be respectful to each other. You got to listen. You have to understand other points of view and thoughts. And you have to really consider those, not just to hear them, but consider them. Successful teams plan well, and I'm going to want you to do that too. So, all right. Here's my basic understanding of teams and my basic guidelines to teams. Everything you needed to know, you learned in kindergarten. And you can read through this. Share everything, play fair, don't hit people. Put things back where you found them, which not all of you did. I had to put cardboard away and I had to put scissors away and I had to pick up a few things. Not much, most of you did really well in the lab, but there was some stuff to pick up, right? Pick up after yourself. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat, please. Flush the toilet. Warm cookies and milk are good for you. Live and balance, live a balanced life, right? Learn something, some draw, paint, all those good things that you do in kindergarten, you should do your entire life. And when you go out in the world, watch out for traffic. You don't want to get hit. Old hands stick together. So take care of your teammates. That's all this is saying. Just take care of each other. All right. Each team member should stay focused, help build the team, communicate, promote a positive environment, work hard, be patient. Don't expect perfection from your team members. If you do that, your team will function fantastic and you will get a good product out of the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, if we miss the mark on one of these things, it's gonna be a problem. All right, that's good for now. Take care, I will see you on Monday and we'll have another lab. Have a good weekend.